Welcome back to The Der Show. The woke, hard left progressives, progressives, they're regressives, <clears throat> are going absolutely berserk over the prospect that we may get Twitter to allow Donald Trump to come back and have a Twitter account. That's going to end America. Listen to this fundraiser that went out from No Dem Left Behind, uh, an old avowedly hard left progressive uh, group. We'll have time to look into all this later, but for now, this is what we need to be prepared for. Trump will almost certainly get his infamous Twitter account restored, and that will give him the megaphone he needs to pick up right where he left off on January 6, 2021. Other so-called woke progressives are, are, are actually thinking the world is going to come to an end because people they don't agree with are going to have a chance to go on Twitter. They think they own the social media. They think they own Facebook. They own all the other social media accounts. Why shouldn't they own Twitter as well? How dare a free speech advocate buy Twitter and, 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 and take it over? What's it going to do to this country? It's going to actually allow the other side to have a voice. Now, this is not a voice I agree with. I'm a liberal Democrat. I would much prefer people to accept the uh, views of moderate civil libertarian people uh, in the marketplace of ideas. Uh, what I want to see is everything on, on, on Twitter, left, right, center, hard left, hard right, you know, racists, uh, sexists, homophobes, anti-Semites, let them all be on Twitter as long as everybody is allowed. There should be no safe space in the social media for people to be offended and try to shut down uh, the media. There should be response spaces where people get a chance to respond to hate speech or to disinformation or to misinformation, but uh, let them do it uh, and see what prevails in the marketplace of ideas. The American way is build a better mousetrap and people will come and buy it. Answer bad speech with good speech and it will prevail in the marketplace of ideas. At least that's the theory. It was Chief Justice Rehnquist who once said, the First Amendment knows no such thing as a wrong idea. Any idea is protected by the First Amendment. Uh, now, Obviously, Twitter is not governed by the First Amendment. Twitter is a free, open market, privately owned now, not even a public company. It can do what it wants. But my recommendation to Elon Musk is please operate Twitter the way the government would and must operate a governmentally owned uh, unit. Um, uh, yeah, you can censor extreme child pornography, you can center extreme uh, uh, advocacy, not advocacy, but direct incitement to immediate violence. Uh, yeah, you can censor uh, malicious defamation. The Constitution permits all those exceptions to the First Amendment, but if I were Elon Musk, what I would announce on the day I took over is although we're not bound by the First Amendment, the policy of Twitter is the First Amendment principles. If it could be censored, if the government did it, we won't put it on. But if it could not be censored, if it were a governmental unit, then we're not going to censor it. Uh, you know, many universities, including Harvard, uh, announced uh, in principle, in theory, that it would apply the First Amendment to its activities. Now, have they done it in practice? No. But have they at least expressed a principle? Yes. University of Chicago announced the Chicago Principles, which basically um, became uh, the, the leading voice in universities that would allow free speech to go forward under the principles of the First Amendment. Has Chicago followed it? No. They've applied a double standard. Chicago is now listed as one of the most anti-Semitic schools in the United States because it applies a double standard. Um, a Georgetown University applies a horrible double standard. It's going to allow next week, and it should, um, uh, a Palestinian speaker who advocates murder against the, the Jews and 
uh, killing Jews and uh, using whatever means are necessary. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, it fired a professor for raising questions about whether or not President Biden should have limited his choice of the Supreme Court to an African American woman. Free speech for me, but but not for thee. Look. The critics of um, free speech and the critics of Twitter being open to all points of view have an empirical point. Um, you know, it's it's going to produce bad things. It's going to produce all kinds of hate speech. It's going to produce falsehoods. It's going to produce lies. It's going to produce lots and lots of bad stuff. But the framers of the Constitution understood that. They created an experiment in liberty, a dangerous experiment in liberty. They basically said that as long as there's an opportunity to respond and answer, that any idea can be expressed. I own a letter by Thomas Jefferson written on the eve of the 25th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence where he says, as long as there's a chance to respond, we shouldn't be banning things. In that case, it was even incitement to violence, which he, as a matter of policy, said, you know, let them do it as long as the other side has a chance to respond. Uh, look, is the First Amendment perfect? Is free speech cost-free? No, of course not. Free speech can be very expensive in terms of social costs. It can really hurt people. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never harm you. No, that's not true. We learned that as a kid. But bullying and uh, attacks and uh, condemning people for their uh, race or their sexual orientation or their gender... Those are bad things to do, but the First Amendment tolerates bad things to do. To paraphrase uh, Winston Churchill, the First Amendment may be the worst thing ever designed, except for all the others that have been tried over time. What would you have instead of freedom of speech? What would you have? Would you have the head of the NAACP decide what can be shown? Here's Derek Johnson. I've quoted him before. Mr. Musk, free speech is wonderful. Hate speech is unacceptable, unacceptable. Disinformation, misinformation and hate speech have no place on Twitter. Do not allow Trump to return to his platform. This is Derek Johnson, the head of the NAACP. I'm waiting to hear from the ACLU. Where's the ACLU on all of this? The American Civil Liberties Union, or as people now call it, the Anti-Civil Liberties Union, the woke union that always seems to be on the side of progressive, hard left, woke people, regardless of their views on censorship or other policies regarding freedom of speech and the First Amendment. Would, would accepting uh, the NAC President Derek Johnson's views be better than Elon Musk? Uh, he says it's unacceptable. Unacceptable to who? Uh, it was Justice Harlan who, in a great decision of the Supreme Court, I think when I was a law clerk, it was many, many, many years ago, some jerk walked into a federal court wearing a shirt or a jacket, and it said on the back of the jacket, F, and then you fill in the U-C-K, the draft. F, the draft. And he was arrested. And Harlan, who was very conservative and probably never uttered a curse word in his life, in his opinion, uh, reversing the conviction, said one man's vulgarity is another's lyric. Um, you know, or as, as, as George Bernard Shaw once put it, don't do unto others as they would do unto you. Their taste may be different. So the same thing is true with what is hate speech, what is disinformation, what is misinformation. Who's going to be the judge of that? Are there any criteria by which we can objectively and neutrally judge what is hate speech? And if you don't like hate speech, engage in love speech, answer hate speech, expose hate speech, show people that there are racists behind that. That's what I do on this show. That's what I do on this show. It's unbelievable the kinds of garbage that comes across my threshold as the result of this show. And I, I quote it uh, sometimes, and, uh, but I have to tolerate it because I believe in the open marketplace of ideas. If I work for, other than Rumble, another company, I could say, no, no, censor those. Don't let them through. But not Rumble. Rumble's going to let it through. And, you know, lies, lies. 
are going to be perpetrated in the name of freedom of speech. I mean, every third tweet has me frequenting Jeffrey Epstein's island all the time. All right, here's my answer. $10,000 cash to your favorite charity. It can be a neo-Nazi charity. I don't care. Your favorite charity, if you can prove that I was ever on Jeffrey Epstein's island, other than that one time with my wife and my daughter and professor, uh, two professors, a professor from Harvard, uh, well before any young girls ever went on the island, never had a massage on Jeffrey Epstein's island. My wife did from a professional masseuse. $10,000 for anybody who can prove that I was on that island more than once or ever on that island with any young uh, girls. All right, more $10,000. $10,000 if you could ever prove that I was on the, quote, Lolita Express with any young underage girl. That's, every third tweet says that. It's simply false. The manifest prove that I was never in Jeffrey Epstein's airplane with any underage person. The only times I was in his airplane was when I represented him legally. It was not the Lolita Express. It was a smaller airplane. I was on it with lots of distinguished people, members of our legal team, in one case my nephew, we were going to a launch. You know, another $10,000 if you can prove I had sex with any Epstein-related uh, person or any underage person. It's all false. And yet you can say it. You can say it on the uh, Rumble account because we don't censor. But I'm answering you now. I'm answering you directly. $10,000 cash if you can prove the truth of any of the things you've been saying about that. You can't because it's just not true and you can't make up facts. You develop a thick skin if you're a podcaster. I have to develop a thick skin. My family has to develop a thick skin. Every third tweet accuses me of something that obviously the evidence proves beyond any doubt. By the way, for those of you who are interested in the case, we recently uncovered a tape recording of the woman who accused me back in 2011, well before any of these uh, accusations and charges came out in which he essentially admits she never heard of me, didn't know who I was, and never met me, and never did anything improper with me. But people don't care. The truth is not important. If you have been told somebody is guilty, you're going to uh, believe it. If you've been told that uh, making, uh, giving Donald Trump access to his uh, Twitter account is going to end the country, you're going to believe it. It, it. it doesn't matter what the truth is. So, you know, the truth is something that has to be a process. I call it the truthing process. And part of the truthing process is the First Amendment, freedom of speech, the marketplace of ideas. You get to say, I'm a pedophile. I get to prove that none of that is true. The public gets to judge who to believe. I'm prepared to live in that world, painful and difficult as it is. Is my family hurt by those statements being made? Yeah. But does the Constitution require us to tolerate it? Well, mostly. After all, there is a law of defamation. That is constitutional. And if you, in fact, maliciously and with knowledge, um, make a statement that's false and hurtful to somebody, Twitter doesn't have to run that. And Rumble doesn't have to run that. Uh, we allow it, but Rumble doesn't have to run it. It's not protected speech under the First Amendment to the Constitution. So. We live in a raucous world. We live in a world where people don't believe each other. We live in a world where people make outrageous claims and outrageous statements. We live in a world where some people have, you know, hundreds of thousands of Twitter followers and others have very few. I have, I think, over 300,000 uh, uh, Twitter followers, but I, I try to use it uh, responsibly. Um, 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 will it change? Look. The other point that we have in our society is if it's not the government, if it's a private company like Twitter, it comes with an off switch. Rumble comes with an off switch. If you don't like what I'm saying on the show and you don't want to hear it, press the button, turn me off. If you don't like what you hear on Twitter, press the button. Don't subscribe. Don't have an account. Don't watch it. Nobody's making you do it. It's not China. As I said the other day, in China there are two rules. You cannot read or see anything the government doesn't want you to read and see, and you must read, see, and hear that which the government wants you to see, read, and hear. Those rules don't apply in the United States. 
In the United States, you're not obliged to go on Twitter. You're not obliged to go on Rumble. You're not obliged to go on Facebook. That's your choice. If you don't like the way Elon Musk runs Twitter, go to an alternative platform. In fact, Donald Trump apparently is starting an alternative platform. In fact, he said he's not going to go back on Twitter, even if uh, Elon Musk invites him back. I suspect he'll be back. But he has the right not to come back. I have the right to cancel my account. I have the right to answer the defamation that frequently appears by trolls on, on, on Twitter. That's what rights are all about. Rights are not about making you comfortable. Rights are not about giving your ideas self uh, safe spaces. Yeah, you have to be physically safe. And by the way, a number of universities today, a number of universities today, including major universities, are not safe physically for Jews, Zionists, uh, people who oppose abortion, people who are fundamentalist Christians, uh, people who have different views about gay rights than I have and others have. There is physical risk to people on college campuses and universities aren't doing enough to provide safe spaces physically. There's no safe space on a university for any idea. Just like the First Amendment doesn't have any concept of a false idea, a university shouldn't have a concept. In the classroom they can. You can be wrong. 50 years I taught at Harvard, there was never a right answer in any of my classes. That was a teaching technique. No answer was ever right, because you can always criticize the answer or elaborate on the answer or change the answer. But that was a you know, methodological, pedagogical uh, argument. In science, there can be right and wrong, and you can deny somebody tenure if they don't believe in evolution or they don't believe in relativity or um, they have views that are out of the um, uh, scientific uh, uh, correct view. But not in politics. Not in politics. When I was in Brooklyn College, um, there were efforts to try to rid the political science department of anybody who was a socialist or a communist. I was very anti-socialist and very anti-communist, but I defended the right of teachers to be communists, not to teach communism in the classroom. I don't think you should be able to teach capitalism in the classroom either. I don't think any isms belong in the classroom. I don't think feminism belongs in the classroom. I don't think that uh, Judaism belongs in the classroom. None of that does. Uh, the classroom is a place where people should learn how to think, not be told what to think. It is not simply another propaganda vehicle. But outside the classroom, professors have the right to espouse their nonsense, and many do. Uh, I, I don't think there's any place on earth in which more nonsense is espoused than on major universities today outside of the classroom. Professors uh, often are just uh, full of malarkey. Um, uh, look, go back sometime and read Albert Einstein. He's behind me, right there. He's a great scientist. Read some of his stuff on, on, on politics. Um, it, it wasn't particularly thoughtful or, or bright. Um, you know, people are good at certain things and not necessarily at others. Just because a person is an actor doesn't make them uh, somebody that is appropriate for being listened to on politics. The same thing is true of a physicist or a mathematician. Just because you're good at physics and mathematics, or in Noam Chomsky's case, linguistics, doesn't mean you know what you're talking about when it comes to politics. That's why we have the right to listen or not to listen, to pick and choose. I choose to listen. I choose to listen to all points of view. I choose to listen to people who I oppose. I choose to read the New York Times, my God. The New York Times front page has become Pravda. Um, you can't tell the difference today uh, in the New York Times front page between news, news analysis, or opinion. Um, when you know something about a subject and read the New York Times, <laughs> you realize uh, how um, biased and opinionated it, it often is. Uh, I would say the same thing is true of uh, newspapers and media uh, on the right. That's why you have to listen to a lot of things and ultimately you have to form your own opinion. Um, Twitter is global, um, well, mostly global in China. You can't access all of Twitter, probably not in Russia as well. And so I'm not afraid of Elon Musk. And if Elon Musk was a progressive, woke, 
person who I despise, I wouldn't be afraid if he took over or she took over uh, Twitter, as long as there's an opportunity to respond, as long as all points of view can be presented. A, I trust the American people generally to pick the right views, and B, if I don't trust them, nothing I can do about it. Uh, you know, if you're elected in a democracy, uh, that's what prevails. We don't always win. Uh, my side doesn't always win in, in elections, and my side doesn't always win in front of the United States Supreme Court. But we have a process, and the process has to be respected. And that process includes the open marketplace of ideas. And so I'm hoping, I'm hoping that Musk will take his responsibility extremely seriously. He has enormous responsibility today in the global marketplace. And I'm hoping that he follows the principles of the First Amendment. He's not obliged to, but I hope he will. I think that will make America a better place. I think the world a better place. It will be costly. There will be people hurt in the process. But is there any right that doesn't hurt people? Is there any right that's just so clear? The Second Amendment, the right to own guns, there are consequences. The right of a woman to have an abortion, there are consequences. Uh, there are consequences to the exercise of every, every right, uh, except if it's you know, completely personal, John Stuart Mill. You have the right to swing your fists, but not beyond the tip of my nose. And that ought to be the approach to liberty and free speech. I am a libertarian. Uh, that is my strong view. I want to make sure we have maximum liberty consistent with order, and I think that Elon Musk uh, owning and operating Twitter under the principles of the First Amendment will accomplish that. So I got a lot of emails, mostly supporting my views on Elon Musk and, and free speech, but not, not all of them. Um, and I got, uh, uh, you know, views on the other side as well. Um, let me go through some of the letters that I got on it. If Musk follows through and allows free exchange of all opinions, news, and viewpoints, regardless of political affiliation, that would be a watershed for social media platforms. The censorship of discordant voices now is a time so severe it rivals what we see in communist China. No, it doesn't rival what we see in communist China, but it's pretty serious on its own. Um, the way Twitter has acted the last couple of years, banning people for their political views, Elon Musk has to be very good for free speech in America. The left has gotten hold of such a platform and turned it into a political weapon. Elon Musk is now about to right this wrong, and hence the left's meltdown. So, Alan, if you have to ask that particular question, you really need to study the real meaning of free speech. I don't think I need to study the real meaning of free speech. I have lived free speech all of my life, and I continue to manifest free speech. Here's a complimentary one. Professor Dershowitz is always consistent and has been forever in defending the rights of individuals to express their viewpoints openly. I am mystified by some of the critical comments and how personal they are. He's a guy you want in your corner when free speech is under attack. He's always willing to criticize other law professors for supporting oppressive policies. I cannot think of another law professor who calls out colleagues for ignoring how important freedom of expression is in a democracy, I am certain his commitment to free speech has cost him many friends. You can be sure of that. Uh, yet he stands firmly behind his belief over expediency. No, I think that's an accurate description of what I, what I tried to receive. Um, even this one. Um, uh, he is no champion of free speech. No, I'm not a champion of free speech. Neither are the owners of uh, Fox News, but Fox is doing things that others are not. Twitter can be the exception, allowing... The other half of the USA a say, and for the same reason I think Fox is different, that's where the money is, that's where the demand should be. I am a MAGA patriot, but I follow you because you don't let your personal views and ideology interfere with everyone's rights under the Constitution. That is so refreshing in these times in our country. Um, oh, here's one. This is, again, fairly typical of some of the people on this, on this platform. Freedom of speech is absolute, although I'm not sure why the lefty Dershowitz is spreading anti-Putin disinformation. Uh, what has Putin ever done to his people? What has Putin ever done to his people? He has murdered dissidents. He has had his minions inject them with radiation 
and kill them. He has put people in jail for opposing his points of view. What has he done to his people? Look at what Biden or Trudeau have done, et cetera, et cetera. You, you, you can criticize Biden and Trudeau, but don't defend Putin. Putin is not entitled to a defense. He has free speech rights, sure, but he doesn't recognize the free speech rights of others. Uh, and, and, and so it goes on and on and on. Um, most, yeah, you have a few oh, my, my son has a few questions uh, come somebody, from today. Yeah. There's a member something of the public. Uh, the Declaration of Independence imposes a legal duty. The courts do not have Article Three standing to interpret the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence is just that. It's a Declaration of Independence. It has no standing as law. There's nothing in the Declaration of Independence that we have to follow as a matter of law. In fact, the Declaration of Independence was an act of treason. It was an act of lawlessness. It doesn't invoke law. It invokes God, natural law. And when you're going to do a revolution, you don't cite the law. Um, I think it was Hannah Arendt, who I don't generally like, who very perceptively said, Revolutionaries cite natural law or God, um, etc. But once they win the revolution and have to establish a government, then suddenly they're conservative, and that's what we did. Declaration of Independence is filled with, you know, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary, you know, all these rights uh, uh, which were written on a desk brought to Jefferson by his slave, uh, all men are created equal he wrote on the desk brought to him by a black slave. Uh, so the Declaration of Independence, it's nice. I have a copy of it hanging in my house. I refer to it from time to time. It is not the law. The Constitution is the law. The Constitution is a very conservative document, which is why we have the Bill of Rights. The Constitution is a structural document. It creates for the first time in the history of the world a division, a separation of powers the executive enforces the law, the legislature makes the law, the judiciary interprets the law. That's what the Constitution does. There are very few rights in the Constitution. There are two, basically, right, against ex post facto law and bills of attainer. But most of the rest of the Constitution allocates powers and functions. And um, then the framers of the Constitution, enough of them said, we're not signing on to this conservative non-rights doctrine unless we also have a Bill of Rights. And so just a couple of years after the Declaration, after the uh, Constitution was validated by the states and by the people, we amended the Constitution. Originally, there were 12 amendments. The Bill of Rights was 12 amendments. Two of them were rejected. And so the, what was the Third Amendment became the First Amendment. And the First Amendment tells it all. The first words are, Congress shall make no law. It's a restriction on power. It's not so much a grant of rights. There are some that grant rights. Um, the Second Amendment, at least as interpreted by the majority of the Supreme Court, grants the right to, to bear arms. Um, the Fourth Amendment and the Fifth Amendment grant rights of, of, of privacy vis-a-vis -vis the government, not vis-a-vis -vis private parties, also the First Amendment. Only grants rights vis-a-vis -vis the government. It said Congress, but Congress was interpreted to then mean the entire federal government, then through the 14th Amendment. It was interpreted to mean the states as well. So right now, any government unit, whether state or federal, uh, is obliged to follow the First Amendment and cannot prohibit the exercise of free speech. It also cannot establish a religion. Sometimes you have a, a clash and a conflict, uh, the case that was argued in the Supreme Court yesterday, involving Coach Kennedy, who stood at uh, uh, midcourt and exercised his free speech right to pray to God. Yeah, that, that's true. And if he were a Black Lives Matter uh, person, he could exercise his free speech right to kneel and do all of that. But there is a restriction, because the First Amendment also says that Congress may not establish religion, which means the government may not establish religion. It may not choose among religions or between religion and non-religion. So the question in that case is not... Did he have a free speech right to say what he did, uh, but rather does the establishment clause of the prohibition of the Constitution prohibit it? And um, I think reasonable people could disagree about that, but that's 
that's the real issue. Um, there's nothing in the Constitution that says you can't establish Black Lives Matter as the policy of the United States. I hope we don't, but uh, there'd be nothing in the Constitution to prohibit it. Religion was treated separately. We have the free exercise of religion. We have the non-establishment of religion. Often they clash, and it's the role of the Supreme Court to decide whether in a given case the free exercise of religion is more important than the non-establishment or the non-establishment is more important or whether we can strike an appropriate balance. Stay tuned. We'll hear the Supreme Court decision on that. I predict the Supreme Court will probably uphold the right of a coach in the right circumstances at least to be able to pray in, in mid-court. Whether it has a coercive impact on people to join him is the question that some of the justices focused on in yesterday's argument. So, we have freedom of religion, freedom of um, uh, speech, freedom of thought. Um, Elon Musk is not bound by the Establishment Clause, so he can allow um, religious exhortations on, on Twitter. But uh, let's hope that he does the right thing and says, although I have a right not to follow the First Amendment, I choose to follow the First Amendment. It is a good policy. It is good principle, and from now on, Twitter is going to bind itself by First Amendment right of free speech. See you tomorrow.